All right, so let us talk about themes. Themes are the messages Themes are the messages that we deduce from the story. The ideas, the central ideas, the important ideas that can be taken from the story. Themes are the messages that can be deduced from a story. Themes are the central ideas in a story. The thoughts in a story. Every story embodies ideas and they pass on messages so you must always be able to isolate the messages from the story these messages are called themes these messages are called themes remember that all our classes are recorded and uploaded on youtube you are free to visit my YouTube channel, Ayo Atom, to look for the classes, even the ones for the previous years. And remember to subscribe. The subscription is free. All right, so let us continue. There are no innocent stories. There are no innocent stories. All stories are charged with ideologies. There are no innocent stories because all stories are charged with ideologies. <laughs> All stories are ideologically charged. All stories are ideologically charged. This is because the author is always trying to use the story to pass on some messages to the reader. And these messages come in the form of themes. In discussing themes, you can you may want to look at major themes. You may also want to look at minor themes. Major themes are sustained throughout the work. Major themes are sustained throughout the work. They run throughout the work. Whereas minor themes are incidental, they are not sustained throughout the work. Novels usually have major and minor themes. How you identify the major themes is that they are found throughout the work when you put the sum of the story together the entire story together you find major themes running through all the events depict the themes the major themes but for the minor themes the, the isolated cases and incidents and are not sustained throughout the work and not sustained throughout the world. For instance, for instance, in China, Chibes, things fall apart. A clash of cultures is a major theme but wild battery is a minor theme clash of cultures is a major theme but wild battery 
se mai non fin. So web battery is a minor thing and things fall apart. But the a clash of cultures is a major thing. We can also have we can also have historical themes. These themes come as a response to history. So good themes come as a response to history. Like the First World War, the Second World War, colonialism. Slavery, these things are based on history, historical events. Then we also have timeless and universal themes. Timeless and universal themes. Timeless and universal themes. They are so called because they are so called because these themes endure through the ages. These themes endure through the ages. These themes endure through the ages and can be found everywhere on the earth. They are timeless and universal themes meaning that they have been there, they are still there, and will always be there. They are there, they were there, they have been there, they are still there, and will always be there. And they are found among all persons, every people on the earth, not limited to certain places. Examples of timeless and universal themes in literature include love or hatred, love versus hatred, or love and hatred, jealousy, self preservation, self preservation. Self preservation. Yeah, selfishness. And so on and so forth. It is important that the critic of the novel should not only it's important that the critic of the novel should not only identify the theme or the themes in the work he or she must also justify or explain how the theme is reflected or the themes are reflected in the work. Because anybody can mention anything as constituting the themes of a book. Anyone can mention anything as being the themes in the work. But the real critic will be able to or should be able to explain how those themes are found or portrayed in the book by citing 
the relevant portions of the novel. So we will cite the relevant portions of the story to justify his or her identifying such a theme. For instance, if you say that there is a theme of love in a novel, okay, then you should be able to explain how that is portrayed in the text, which part of the story illustrates the theme of love. That's how it works. You don't just say that there is the theme of love and then forget it. You have not answered the question. You need to cite the relevant portions of the story to justify the existence of the theme of love. There's a theme of deception. Which character deceived which character? What happened? Okay? And remember that in discussing literature, we use what we call historic presence. In discussing literature, we use what we call historic presence. Most of your novels are written in the past tense, but ideally, when we are discussing the novel, we are expected to use present tense. We call it historic present. Okay? Which tells the, which reports the events as if they're happening at the moment. For instance, I would say, Okonkwo visits Obierica. Not Okonkwo went to visit Obierica. Because it happened in the past. No. Okonkwo visits Obierica. That's what we call historic present. Because the story is being performed as we narrate it. That's how we discuss literature. So what's the next item? Characterization. Characterization. The word characterization is a noun and it refers to the art, the process of creating characters in a work of art. Characterization refers to the process or the art or the act of creating characters in a work of art. And what is a character? Or what are characters? What is a character and what are characters? A character is the fictional personage in a work of art. Or characters are fictional personages in a work of art. Characters are fictional personages in a work of art. Uh, let me spell personages. P E R S O N A G E S. Fictional personages in a work of art. They are the author's creation. Characters are the author's creation. And they represent human beings in the author's world or in the world created by the author. So, what makes a character is a mix of many things. What makes a character is a mix of many things. One of these is 
the character of the character it's what we call the character of the character that is the person's moral constitution how the person behaves how the person acts whether good or bad right so sometimes in the work of art you can class the characters into the good guys and the bad guys okay and actually class the characters into the good guys and the bad guys at that level we are talking about the character of the character the character's morality talk about the character's morality so but the character is also more than that the character is more than that and there are other criteria used in determining a character and one of them is what the character says about himself or herself what the character says about himself or herself what the character says about himself or herself two what others say about the character what others say about the character one what the character says about himself or herself two what others say about the character and three what the character does what the character does what the character does by that we mean the action of the character the action of the character so you need to put these three together in order to determine a character what does the character say about himself what do others say about the character and what does the character do when you put all of this together you will determine a character because there are characters most human beings are likely to say very wonderful things about themselves okay but they're not really good and then some other human beings all also like spoiling the name of others but that that does not make that those people are not good too okay and then so what you need to do is to match what the character says what the character does in relation to what others say about the character when you put all of that together you should be able to determine the character um, in the text so when we are discussing the character we do have major characters and minor characters we do have major characters or minor characters of course we have uh, major characters are main characters so you need to be conversant with these terms because when you are discussing the novel we wanted to use technical terms in discussing the novel right is to use the technical language so that was saying main character you can say main character you can say principal character you can say major character they mean the same thing they mean the same thing these characters dominate the plot of the story main characters dominate the plot of the story they are found everywhere in the story in the major parts of the story that's why they are major characters they are central they are central characters too that's another way to call them central characters because they are found 
at the forefront of events, the main events. Okay? They are found in the forefront of the main events in the story. So you can also call them central characters. Because the important events revolve around them. They are the shakers and movers of things in the story. These characters are the shakers and movers of things in the story. Okay? They make things happen, and you tend to find them everywhere. Those are main characters. Okongwa is a main character. It's not part of the story that is not um, the central focus. And central characters are easily remembered compared to minor characters. I like to remember the central characters in a work because they are found in every main event in the story. So on the other hand, minor characters do not feature prominently in the story. Minor characters do not feature prominently in the story. They come and then they go. And we don't see them again for a long time. And they're not featured in the story. Okay? Prominently. Like the boy that Okonkwo kills in as of those um, funeral. It's a minor character. Okay? We never knew him before until that time. Okay? <coughs> so you don't see much of minor characters in the work. That's how you know minor characters in the work. And then in discussing characters, we can talk about the hero and the heroine. The hero and the heroine. These are terms that you should use. You need to know who the hero of the work or the heroine of the work is. So the hero is a guy, as the heroine is a girl. Okay? The hero is a man, the heroine is a woman. Okay? Uh, but since I'm speaking to Gen Z's, I can say that the hero is a guy and the heroine is a girl. Okay? And the hero is known traditionally for courage and physical strength. The hero is known traditionally for what? For courage and physical strength. Fearless. And even selfless. Because you know the hero is a person that if a lion comes into this class, all everybody will run, but the hero will stand to defend the class against the lion. Okay? He will say, all of you stand behind my back until I've killed this lion. You understand? That's the hero. He doesn't mind dying while fighting the lion. As long as the lion has not eaten any of you. So that's the hero. So it might be that at the end of the day, he kills the lion and the lion also kills him. Okay? And so what happens is that you put all your lives to him and you have to remember him for as long as you live. And then you're going to tell the story to your next generation of how one man stood up to defend the whole community against the plague of the lions. That's how heroism works in the traditional sense. There's a mix of fearlessness, courage, bravery, and selflessness. In traditional heroism. There has to be a show of physical strength, especially in wars. So that's a hero. Right? I hope we have heroes in the house. Okay? Okay? So if we have heroes now, we are not afraid of the lion that is coming.
Now, if this hero is a woman, we use the name heroine. H A R O I N E. But there's nothing wrong if you use hero for a woman. Just saying. Okay? There's nothing wrong. But you will have to be specific. You can use heroine. They have the same attributes. People, men and women who stood up for their community. These guys are legends. Okay? We find these heroes in epics, epic tales, sagas. So, again, in traditional heroism, in traditional heroism, the hero has to be a highly placed member of society. The hero has to be a highly placed member of society. Especially in the Aristotelian conception of heroism, the hero has to be a highly placed member of society. A king, a queen, a knight, a noble person, a person of noble birth, one that we look up to, one who is better than all of us. He's brave, he's kind, he's gentle, he's, uh, self -pres um, he's uh, selfless. He's very muscularly strong. Can fight for hours without getting tired, can kill anybody. They talk about people like Achilles, Hector, Paris. Hannibal are traditional heroes. Highly placed members of societies, warriors in their own rights. But Aristotle has said that the hero must have a weakness in a tragedy. The hero must have a moral flaw. Must have a moral flaw. So I said that the hero must have a moral flaw. So thus, traditional heroism, that weakness will lead to its fall, to its destruction and death. But in the modern conception of heroism, the hero is no more a highly placed member of society. The hero is a common man, can be a common man. Anyone can be a hero. In the modern conception of the of, of heroism, the hero does not need to be a highly placed member of society. He only needs to be a human being. All right? And he doesn't need to have muscular strength. He must not be able to, it's not only when he's able to carry this house on his head, like Samson, pull the houses down. That's traditional heroism. Okay? The, the heroism in the modern, modern period is more or less moral and intellectual. What makes a hero in the modern sense is moral and intellectual strength no more muscular strength talk about moral bravery intellectual bravery the ability to stand up to what is right tell the truth the ability to sacrifice and the little one has for the good of others amounts to heroism it's not until you pull the house down or feed the whole village. So that is where we are. And the person can be a common man. So if you remember that song, you are a legend. 
and the normally sites, the song normally sites, a mother or a father who sells newspapers to feed the family is a legend. So that's the kind of heroism that we are talking about. You don't need to do much, right? It doesn't take much to be a hero these days. Okay, just a kind act here and there. Uh, seeing an old woman on the road and helping the woman with the load makes you a hero. Seeing an old man trying to cross the streets, but the traffic is high, and you intervene and help the person to cross the street, that's heroism. You don't need to pull down the world. Okay? The character does not need to pull down the world. All right? I'll make, the, make time to stop. We need to stop time and move through space. Okay? Or we come to class and someone offers to wipe the board for others as a heroism. Okay? That's why we call those people spirit field human beings. That's spirit field human beings. Okay? Because they think about the welfare of others. That's what we are talking about. So do we have such heroes in the house? Good. So let us hear hero and heroine. Hero and heroine. Let us talk about the protagonist and antagonist. The protagonist and antagonist. The protagonist and antagonist. Good, 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 good. So the protagonist and antagonist are major characters, often major characters in a work of art. They are usually major characters in a work of art. The protagonist is a hero. The protagonist is a hero. Usually loved by the audience. Or the hero who earns the sympathy of the audience. The audience loves him in a way. You get get. And he's usually opposed by the antagonist. He has an enemy, and the enemy is called antagonist. He has an enemy, and the enemy is called antagonist. So we can define the protagonist as a central character a hero who is opposed by the antagonist and we can define the antagonist as the character that opposes the protagonist in a work of art the character that opposes the protagonist in a work of art so the existence of protagonists and antagonists in works of literature is an extension of real world scenarios where successful people are not always loved but are, can be opposed by those close to them or the idea that you cannot be successful in life without having enemies there has to be someone out there who just can't like you who just won't like you no matter what you do and you have to come to terms with the fact or if they see that you are succeeding they do everything to pull you down it's a fact of life 
not everyone will like you. The teacher teaches this all the time, especially when you are succeeding. So that's why all protagonists have antagonists. And if you don't have an antagonist, then you cannot be a protagonist. Because if you say, I am the hero, I am the protagonist, then we ask you, show me your enemies. Where are your enemies? Where are those enemies? Those people that are looking for ways to bring you down. Where are they? Otherwise, we cannot justify your protagonist status. So when you're analyzing characterization in literature, please remember these terms. Remember hero and heroine. Remember major characters and minor characters. Remember protagonist and antagonist. And of course, even as we speak, I suppose you can think of some of the works you read and be able to isolate which character is the protagonist and which is the antagonist. And of course, in the work that you're, you're going to be reading for the test, like the Orphan's Throne, the Orphan's Throne by Robert Udaipa, or Worry, Not the Car the Last by Idedo Sayande, you might be able to discern who the protagonist is and if they have antagonists. Okay? Um, that reminds me, I actually have an anal analysis of why not the car last on my website. And so if you Google why not the car last by the same, I think you'll find it online. So that if you are reading the novel, you can also back it up with the analysis. Let's just look at, let's look at, round and flat character. Round and flat character. Round characters are fully developed characters. Round characters are fully developed characters. A round character is a fully developed character. A character is said to be fully developed. A character is said to be fully developed when all the sides to the character are exposed. When all the sides of the character are exposed and we see the character in a dynamic way, being able to change from one stage or from one state to another. There's a certain element of unpredictability often associated with the round character. An element of unpredictability often associated with the round character. You cannot predict him. You don't know what he or she is going to do the next moment. Okay? You know what the character is going to do the next moment. But they are fully developed. We see all parts of the character. And then we can talk about a flat character. We can talk about a flat character. That's opposite the round character. The flat character does not change in the course of the story. 
the flower character remains the same throughout the story. Does not change in the course of the story. The flower character does not change in the course of the story. It tends to remain the same. It's flat. If the character starts out with a certain mindset, that mindset will remain. So then remember that the development of the character is not physical growth. When you want to talk about the development of a character, we, are, we want to look at the psychological transformation of the character, including moral transformation of the character. The character can transform from good to bad and from bad to good. That's how we measure the dynamism of a character. So if the character remains the same, does not change, does not, we can predict the, action, the character's actions, then the character is flat. And so, you should be able to identify which character is round or rounded, and which character is flat, based on this description. Based on this description. And that takes us to the dynamic and aesthetic characters. The dynamic and aesthetic character. The dynamic and aesthetic character. Round characters tend to be dynamic. While flat characters tend to be static. Round characters tend to be dynamic. They change in the course of the story. They're unpredictable. Flat characters tend to be static. They remain unchanged. They're not dynamic. They're predictable. There's not this, not the difference, and no peace. Then let us talk about stereotypical characters. I'll call them stereotypes. Stereotypes. Stereotypical characters or stereotypes. These are characters whose roles are based on bias assumptions. Whose roles are based on biased assumptions. based on their age, gender, race, ethnicity, and profession. The perception of stereotypes in literature is usually based on biased assumptions, prejudiced assumptions, assumptions by people in terms of how they judge others based on their age, based on their gender, and their race, ethnicity, and so on and so forth, and profession. So let me tell you how stereotypes work, how stereotype works. If you ask someone, where are you from? Which one is your local government? And the person says, I am from Oran, right you are likely to judge the person based on that statement immediately the person says i'm from Iran. you'll be like 
God forbid, I cover myself with the blood of Jesus. I cover myself with the blood of Jesus. Because you people are those who fly in the night. You guys are the witches and the wizards. And I'm sure that you have one in you. So I cover myself with the blood of Jesus. Okay? That's territory. We are judging that person based on his little government. All right? The person might not be a witch, but there is a general assumption that those people from those little governments, from that little government area, there's so much witch there. And there are so many witches and wizards there. And so on and so forth. Or the idea that or the idea that the the guy from the east the guy from the eastern part of Nigeria okay is likely money conscious okay and that he may likely um, get money through um, conventional ways. Okay? That when the person says, be my wife, you say, go, I don't want to be used for rituals. Okay? It's stereotypical assumptions. It might not be everyone. Okay? It might just be um, general bias, bias um, that people have about other people. Or in the United States, let's leave this part of the world. In the United States, where black people are stereotyped as criminals, gangsters, and so profiled, they are likely to be shot by the police without even listening to them, without even asking them questions. They are shot just merely they see your skin. Pigmentation. Okay? Because by that skin pigmentation, you are dangerous. You are a dangerous person. Okay? Which must be shut down. Or... You see a lady driving a very posh vehicle, and you assume it is the husband that bought it for her. Remove this thing from the road. This is the husband bought for you. Okay? Because you believe that there's a general assumption that the woman cannot possibly afford a, a car by herself. It has to be the husband that bought it for her. That's stereotype. Okay. Or that because the person is a woman, the person will not have strength to fight you as a man. Okay, it's weak. Sometimes you might be surprised. Okay. <laughs> because there are some women now that most women now decide to um live above stereotypes right to conquer the stereotypes in the environment so i hope you now understand what we mean by stereotypes and you, know, you need to understand how characters are depicted as type or stereotypes or what we call type characters in the work of art these characters are uh, so typical characters are characters whose roles are easily predictable in the work of art just by their appearance or just by the um, costumes. You know exactly what they are going to do or how they will be behave. 
some professions are usually stereotyped like the way lawyers speak okay and some people say we leave that one is an english professor and when they said an english professor has come and the person starts speaking you know exactly that what was said about the person is correct okay so we know that doctors will behave in a certain way in certain situations teachers will behave in a certain way in certain situations these are stereotypical characters so as I said more and more people are emerging from stereotypical roles assigned to them in history, in, in history uh, by society, by cultures for instance um, where people thought that women will remain in the kitchen once you're married you go to the kitchen and then you cook for your husband wash plates clean the house do everything fine and you don't do any other thing apart from that you bear children that was all that was expected of the woman it wasn't expected that a woman would sit on the board of companies or run a country or run a state okay but People are emerging from there. So, but if so, if you judge somebody that, oh, um, you are a woman. So when you graduate, you get married, and then you stay in your husband's house, you know, and prepare cook, cook food for your husband, their children. You are simply stereotyping that person. Okay, telling the person that there could be no, you couldn't have more than this. All right. What's the next item? Okay, let's talk about language and style. Literature is a language art. Literature is a language art. This means that it is through the aesthetic manipulation of language, it's through the aesthetic use of language that we have what we call literature. Because in literature, language is used in an aesthetically pleasing way or manner. Literature language is used in an aesthetically pleasing way or manner so the best way to understand literature is to study the language of the text most Most African novels are written in English. Most African novels are written in English. That is an aspect of the uh, um, discussing language. But that is just the surface. In talking about the language of a novel, there are a number of issues that must be raised. First of all, we must understand why the term language and style is necessary. Or why the terms are always used together, language and style, language and style, language and style. It is because 
You cannot study the style of a work of art without paying attention to its language. And to study the language of a work of art is to study its style. That's why you always have language and style. Language and style. Style, in the first place, refers to the linguistic habit of a writer. Style refers to the linguistic habit of a, a writer. The linguistic habit of a writer. The style. How the writer uses language in a text constitutes the writer's style. Every writer has a unique style of writing. Every writer has a unique style of writing. This is called individual style or personal style. This is called individual style or personal style. We know this by observation. And what do we observe? The recurrent aspects of the writer's use of language. The things that recur in the writer's use of language constitute the writer's particular personal individual style. Okay, style is like handwriting. It can be traced to an individual. We can have an unwrite, a handwriting. Can have a handwriting, and then we say, "I know the honor of this handwriting." The handwriting belongs to Nsika Nambasi. The handwriting belongs to Nsika Neyo. Okay. I had an uncle, I had an uncle once. Whenever he comes home and says something um, in the wrong place or says that things are not right in the house, he will know the person who did it. He will say, This looks like, this is like Mary's work. This, this can only be done by Mary. <laughs> Understand? This action. There's no other person that can do this kind of thing. So you leave your... You leave traces behind by the things you do repeatedly. All right? Okay, that's why most of your parents know you. The you know, things you can do and the things you can't do. So you know, this 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 thing was done by you. I know there's no other person because you have your style, <laughs> right? So writing is like that. Writing is like that. People don't always use language the same way. You have your unique way of using language. You have a unique way of speaking. All lecturers have their own unique way of teaching or speaking. All right which sometimes even students mimic, okay? <laughs> so that's how it works. So some students might mimic the lecturer's style of teaching. So let me, I want to teach like how Dr. Johnson used to teach. And they'll come out and do exactly like that. That's the person's style. So the same thing with writing, with a novel. So style 
uh, the study of style goes back to the classical period. The study of style goes back to the classical period. The study of style goes back to the classical period. With Cicero. With Cicero. With Cicero. He laid the foundation for the study of style. Cicero laid the foundation for the study of style. So let the foundation for the study of style. Of course, this was in the classical period. The style theories of Cicero classified style into three levels. The style studies of Cicero classify style into three levels. Into three levels. You have the high style. You have the what? The high style. The high style. You have the high style. You don't call it the high style, you call it the grand style. You call it what? The grand style. You call it the grand style. And then you have the middle style. You have the middle style. You don't call it the middle style, you call it the mean style. You call it what? The mean style. The mean style. You call it the mean style. Mean M E A N M E A N mean style. You get yes. good. And then finally you have the low style. You have the low style. You have the low style. You don't call it the low style, you call it the plain style. You call it what? The plain style. Plain style. Plain style. So you have the high, the middle, and the low. You have the high, the middle, and the low. You have the what? High, middle, and low. Good. Very good. So, by the 18th century, we've had the doctrine of decorum. By the 18th century, we've had the doctrine of decorum. The doctrine of what? Decorum. D-E-C-O-I-M. Decorum. The doctrine of the doctrine of decorum specifies that the level of style in a work should be appropriate to the social class of the speaker, to the occasion on which it is spoken, and to the dignity of its literary genre. I'll take that again. The doctrine of decorum practiced in the 18th century stipulated that the level of style in a work should be appropriate to the social class of the speaker, to the occasion on which it is spoken, and to the dignity of its literary genre. To the dignity of his literary genre. So that means that each work should use the style suitable to it. This simply means that each work should use the style suitable to the work. For instance, the epic should use the grand style. Epic should use the grand star.
because it talks about kings and highly placed people so that the style has dignity the language is refined the style is elevated that's the grand style the mean style is for entertainment the mean style is for entertainment for storytelling because it aims to please aims to free all it aims to please and it aims to thrill. It's a suitable style for narration. You use the epic style to talk about the epic, because the epic talks about, about important members of society. You use the mean style to discuss, to, to write literature for entertainment purposes. And then you use the plain style for teaching, because it's simple. Because the plain style signifies simplicity in the use of language. The, the plain style sig uh, um, signifies simplicity in the use of language. So you use it when you want to teach or educate. That's why whenever I come to class, I use the plain style to teach. I'm always teaching using the plain style so that everybody will understand. Right? Okay, so we are going to stop there for today. We'll meet it again at 2. Yeah, see you guys.